All right, we are looking at futures down again after making up yesterday all that we lost on Monday, 30 minutes until the start of trading. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Chanali Basic on assignment and Bloomberg Open Interest. It starts right now. Coming up, big tech crackdown. The Justice Department is weighing a Google breakup in an historic antitrust case. Meanwhile, Boeing withdrew its contract offer, saying talks with its largest union don't make sense at all at this point. Plus, we're going to get minutes and a chorus of Fed speakers today. This hour, former Kansas City Fed President Esther George joins the show. First off, let's take a look at where markets are trading. In terms of futures, as I said, we're down, but not by very much. Only about five-tenths of, uh, well, five one-hundredths of one percent, I should say, on the NASDAQ 100 futures, more than one-tenth of one percent. Katie, yesterday we made back literally all of what we lost on Monday. We certainly did, and taking a little bit of a breather this morning at the index level, let's take a look under the hood, see if we can find anything more exciting. And right up top here, you actually have U.S. listed miner Arcadian Lithium will be acquired by Rio Tinter for $6.7 billion. That's a 90% premium from Arcadium's closing price last week. And as you can see, shares currently up about 30% as a result pre-market. Moving on, you do have Boeing, of course. Shares lower after negotiations to resolve that manufacturing strike collapse. We're entering a fourth week of the strike. It's been nearly a month. You also have S&P Global warning that it may cut the plane maker's credit rating to junk. As such, shares currently down about 1.7%. And let's check in on Alphabet, of course. It's a little bit lower as antitrust officials consider forcing Google to sell off parts of its business in what would be an end historic breakup, Matt. But of course, we've been dealing with this headline risk for a while. And as such, shares only down about four tenths of a percent. Yeah, that's because we knew this was an option back on August 5th when the judge handed down his decision. On August 14th, we wrote a story uh, citing people familiar that said this is an option. And the new news today is that the Justice Department has confirmed that it is one option that they're considering. What I find interesting is that uh, there's so much dominance in terms of ad revenue from search. I would have thought that it all comes from video. Uh, you can see from this chart that $457 billion of all online ad spending um, is estimated to come from search for this year. Only $103 billion from video, but you have yeah. to imagine that Google dominates there as well with YouTube. Yeah, you're certainly right, of course. Uh, this obviously is a big, sprawling empire, and you can see that reflected in the chart. I will say, of course, even though, you know, this is very incremental new news, this has been a big weight to Google, to Alphabet, rather, over the past three months. It's down 13 percent since about uh, July 10th or so. So, obviously, it's been weighing on the Which stock. Which is, you know, big for a two trillion dollar you've been feeling it at the index company. level i have been feeling it oh yeah uh, in specifically. your 401k let's get more into the potential google breakup with bloomberg technology co's ed ludlow in san francisco ed as katie points out um this does feel extremely incremental i mean have we moved anywhere at all since august 5th we don't even have um the, this part of the case starting until spring of next year, and then we don't expect Meta to make a decision until August of 2025. You did very well to recount the timeline and chronology, which is that Bloomberg had reported that the DOJ would do this. And I guess, look at the stock. I think we're down a few tenths of a percent in pre-market. The sell side note from JP Morgan is, well, the DOJ saying it's considering proposing to the judge a remedy of breakup is well within its playbook. So it's not really a surprise to anyone. It's a 32-page document that in one month's time they'll tell us a bit more about, and there's a number of options on the table. A little bit more interesting to me is the data, because in the world that, that we operate in over here on the West Coast at least, the data behind search and the data behind AI, which Google is in, in a competitive field in, one of the other proposals from the DOJ is that the court enforce Google making that data available to its competitors. Now, that would be an interesting development. Mm. But what they don't do in that document is explain what breaking up looks like, um, at least in the, the 32 pages that I read. 
And of course, uh, Matt is really determined to make this not interesting, but let's knit this into the broader <laughs> context because you think about big tech, it feels like overall we've seen this massive crackdown coming from antitrust regulators who've been yes. feeling it looks like pretty emboldened. Yes, there, there are two um, uh, bodies involved here, the Department of Justice and the FTC. And it is not just Alphabet, the parent of Google. They have looked also at Amazon and at Apple, other mega cap technology companies. They have looked at their investments in the field of artificial, in technology, artificial intelligence technology. Um, I think that what's interesting in the, this specific case around the search business is the idea that you would go to Alphabet or Google, let's just call it Google, search is its bread and butter. When you go to FA Go on the Bloomberg terminal, it is the most important part of earnings. And uh, it would be the biggest antitrust action in this country since Microsoft 20 years ago, which I think the three of us talked about. I actually have a kind of sense of deja vu because <laughs> Matt is really right. Nothing has fundamentally changed since August. But this is, this is a part of a much broader initiative, and it's not unique to the United States because Europe is looking at it as well. The, pro the point being in all of this, nothing's yet happened. Mm. And so then if you're an investor, you have to weigh up the, um, uh, what do they call those markets, the arbitrage risk of whether something does in the end. Well, Ed, we will certainly have this conversation again. So uh, we will many feel times before many August times. of 2025. A lot of deja vu I, coming I your way. Great to see you, though. That, of course, is Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. And tune in today for the kickoff of Bloomberg Screen Time in LA. It's a gathering of business leaders, celebrities, entrepreneurs defining the next phase of pop culture. That you know what I'm great. pumped about? Tell me about it. Ed and Caroline have yeah. a special show on Friday. Bloomberg Tech on Friday will be at Rocket Labs. Yeah. And to me, that is fascinating. When I can hear Ed Ludlow reporting on rockets, I'm tuned in for the whole hour. I know. I hope they just have, of course, you know, a backdrop that's just stars and space. And that'll be a lot of fun to watch. But don't go anywhere, because we have a great conversation coming up right now. Let's welcome in Sarah Malik. She is head of equities and fixed income, also chief investment officer over at Nuveen. She oversees more than a trillion dollars in assets. And Sarah, it's great to have you with us. Feels like there's so much uncertainty in this market anywhere you look. One of the big things, of course, is the election coming up in 26 days. Between now and then, over the next 26 days, how seriously can you take any one day of action across any market right now? I think there's three things to, that markets are worried about until we get to the election, and that's inflation, upcoming third quarter earnings, and this backup in yield. So let's start with inflation on deck for this week, CPI and PPI. I think CPI likely comes in hot for a second month in a row. We'll be closely watching three areas, areas that's airfares, autos and shelter prices to see if any of those remain hot or heat up again. And then PPI, the interesting thing there is to watch what feeds into PCE, which is the Fed's preferred barometer of inflation. On PPI, we'll be watching closely for portfolio management, healthcare services, and airfare. That tends to lead into that PCE number. And secondarily is third quarter earnings. We're going to get a lot of earnings out of banks at the end of this week. That kicks off earnings seasons. season. For this quarter, what you've seen is the typical Analyst estimates have been going down leading up to this quarter, but we still have a pretty healthy about 4% earnings growth expectations year over year, led by technology. So those tech stocks, again, need to meet that high bar in order to help this earnings growth quarter. And then, of course, this backup in yields. It, yields have been backing up because the economies remain strong, including with payrolls that we saw last Friday at about a quarter million uh, payrolls for the month of September. But people are getting concerned that yields are now up at, for the 10-year, up at 4%. So we have to deal with all of that before we even get to this election next month. So there's a lot to drive volatility, Sarah. There's a lot to drive um, concern as, as usual, right? So much uncertainty, as always. But what do you expect from stocks. Can we get through this to a higher level? I mean, 57.51 is, I think, where we closed yesterday, which is already, you know, more than most of the strategists in our survey expect for year end 2024. Is there anything, is this earnings growth that we expect going to be able to power stocks higher through the end of the year? 
Well, we've seen volatility as measured by the VIX picking up recent, recently. So this is telling you the investors are becoming more fearful because of these issues. And let's not forget also the uh, unfortunate events unfolding in the Middle East, the impact that can have on energy prices and on, on global markets. And then, of course, China that's been very volatile recently. Now, of course, moving back to the downside as a lot of this stimulus expectation was, was a letdown for investors. So I think markets likely at this level, uh, the risk is to the downside, more volatility. You know, we'll see with CPI coming in a little bit hot next month. I think people are going to say, you know what, the U.S. economy does remain strong and we can rely on that. But inflation is here to stay. It's still very sticky. We have uncertainty around this election. So, you know, as long as the economy holds us up, that's great. But markets at trading, as you said, at about 5,700, I think the risk is a bit more to the downside than the upside for, for the near term. So let's talk a little bit more about those geopolitical risks. Of course, a conversation we've been having on this show is how do you hedge it, especially when it comes to the oil market? I thought it was really interesting that you had BNP Paribas Exane cut its recommendations on BP, Exxon, a few other names on excess supply. And of course, you've seen oil react, move higher to those tensions that we're seeing. But it still seems like at the end of the day, it's supply that overwhelms everything else. Yeah, and it's interesting, just looking at third quarter earnings, energy stocks are expected to perform the worst with earnings down over 20% for the third quarter. And that's that's going to be you know, an interesting, but with oil prices going up, of course, we're going to be more interested in terms of what are these companies' outlooks. We have to balance what's going on in the Middle East as a bit of a black swan event when it comes to energy prices, because we don't know how this will unfold. But of course, supply has been creeping up with OPEC and other areas. So, you know, I think it depends. Energy in general has to do with you know, what is supply doing? How does demand look? Demand looks pretty strong with the economy remaining strong globally and especially in the U.S. And what are producers doing? Are they returning cash to shareholders? Or are they pulling more barrels out of the ground and in increasing supply even more? For this cycle, producers have been more disciplined. But with energy prices and oil prices up at about the $80 level, I think similar to the markets, a little more downside than upside there because they have moved up quite a bit on these geopolitical risks. We, we got uh, a, a big positive surprise, Sarah, in our last jobs report. It looks like, you know, maybe the Fed went a little too far with 50 basis points. Maybe not. I guess it really doesn't matter, 25 basis points, the big scheme of things. But we're going to talk to Esther George, um, formerly of the Fed, next. What would you ask her? What would you ask anyone on the FOMC right now? I think the question is, would the Fed have still cut by 50 basis points if they knew jobs numbers were going to recover to this quarter million level? The Fed's been very clear that they're focused on the labor markets, and labor markets have been coming in a little bit weaker than expected as we went into that September rate cut. And of course, now labor markets have rebounded. However, my caution with labor markets is that if you look at recessions, employment tends to crack right when the recession starts. So it's very hard to rely on employment data to predict a recession. So that makes it more challenging in this world of are we going to get a recession? Are we not going to get one? You know, we're closely watching the consumer, consumer trends. We'll see retail sales next week. What's the consumer doing? I, I am still concerned about a recession. I think this era of high interest rates and sticky inflation eventually will lead to that downturn. But of course, labor markets tough to predict. You know, did the Fed go too far in September? I think the answer is maybe once we saw this September payrolls number roll in at 250 plus thousand. All right, Matt, I hope you wrote that down for Esther George. <laughs> would, they, would she still have gone 50? Sarah, always great to speak with you. Really appreciate the suggestion as well. That is Nuveen's Sarah Malik. Now, coming up, as we mentioned, former Kansas City Fed President Esther George. She joins us from the Citadel Securities Global Macro Conference. That conversation next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Bathik. I'm here at the Citadel Securities Global Macro Conference, of course, for Bloomberg Open Interest. And I'm standing by now with former Kansas City Fed President Esther George. What a great time to have you a day before CPI, just after the last jobs print. That's actually just where I want to start, because, of course, with jobs coming in hotter than every analyst and economist surveyed by Bloomberg, even revisions for the month before revised higher do you think, and I think this is the most direct question here, do you think that 50 basis points was too much? Well, that will be something for history to judge, I think, in this scenario. But certainly how great to see a jobs report like that. But I would just keep in mind it is one uh, that will come in a series. And we have seen, because of how this economy is really trying to reach its footing post-pandemic, 
that we've seen things move up and down from inflation to the job market. So very much a welcome report, but too soon to draw big conclusions about what it might mean longer term. Even in the near term, how much more room do you think it gives the Fed to cut for the rest of this year alone? So I think what the Fed is trying to figure out is how to balance its two objectives for thinking about the labor market, for making sure that it gets back to its 2% target in a, in a timely way. It means now they have to judge risk around each of those. And as those come into better balance, as they say, they're trying to decide where to put the weight on that. And I think when you heard the chairman uh, talk at the NABE conference that uh, we're going to look at our SEP forecast, which shows two more cuts uh, the rest of the year. That's a baseline, but I think not a given yet until we see how some of the other data, including tomorrow's print, well, comes out. Well, let's go right there. How comfortable are you that we're on a path sustainably to 2%? So I think, like others, I'm confident that we have seen that inflation come down. But I've always been among those that believe this last mile can be the most difficult. Because now you're trying to get from something in the neighborhood of 3% inflation to 2 and over what period of time can you do that and still ensure that the public believes you will get back there, that those inflation expectations stay anchored. So I remain pretty focused on uh, where we are with the current inflation dynamics. Hey, Esther, Matt Miller here in uh, the studio at 731. Lex, really appreciate you joining us today. I want to ask about um, the Fed's data dependency. Is it too sort of immediate, too much in the now? Do, do they need to look ahead if we get, for example, um, you know, more deficit spending from the U.S. government, bigger uh, debt, inflationary policies from whomever wins the presidential election. Should the Fed start to worry about um, that now or just wait until uh, it happens? Well, they have to worry about it now in terms of developing what I call a set of scenarios that could unfold in the economy. And of course, that's at the root of how a committee, how forecasters develop a view of what the future looks like. So yes, they have to look at today's data to help shape that forecast. And that's why you hear them talk about being data dependent, is because each one of those data points has the potential to give them a different read on trends or something that's changing in the economy. But as you've noted, there are many things that right now may be question marks that lie ahead that they will have to prepare for when they think about it. And I think they have also noted, we think our policy is in a good place. In other words, we can move more aggressively if the economy weakens, we can uh, stay longer at this interest rate if it looks like things are heating up again. And so they've given themselves some latitude, some options, if you will, for how to think about an uncertain future. I also wonder about the um, Fed balance sheet on the Bloomberg. We have a great uh, function. If you type Fed, Bal, Go, you can see um, the enormity of it. It's come down, of course, from $8.5 trillion, but we're still looking at um, about more than $6.5 trillion. Can the Fed continue to run this off? Is there more room for quantitative tightening? Well, if you follow the, the Fed's stated game plan, which is um, a goal to shrink that balance sheet to the smallest uh, size needed to continue their operating framework, you would have to say, yes, there is more room to go. And it's a little bit... Um, of a, of a dynamic of saying you are tightening by rolling off your balance sheet while you are easing the short-term interest rate. But of course, this is important, I think, in the long run for how the Fed conducts monetary policy, for the implications of that balance sheet, should they need more capacity at some point uh, due to a disruption. And of course, they don't know the stated end point for this. So when people say, how, what will be the size of the balance sheet when they finish, that's an unknown. They have to watch the demand for reserves from the banking system. They have to watch treasury market functioning to make sure that that remains uh, healthy. And so I think it's an unknown destination at this point, but direction of travel, I think, really important in terms of how they've laid out uh, their plan to reduce that balance sheet. 
And Esther, this is Katie Greifeld sitting next to Matt in 731 Lex. I do want to build on what Shanali asked you, of course, about how much room the Fed has to cut rates. I'm curious about when you look at the dynamics of the inflation that we have in this economy right now. Of course, we got hotter than expected wage growth last Friday in the, the jobs report. There's some people saying that we could get a hotter than expected CPI report tomorrow. Could you see a scenario where actually the Fed stays on hold in November and potentially entering into sort of a stop and start rate cutting cycle? Well, I think they will have to think about that depending on how, again, this report comes in, the composition of it, very important. So they've seen goods inflation really back off. Services inflation has started to come down. The housing component is continuing to stay sticky. And so with the CPI uh, currently at a core level, running closer to three, the PCE also running well over their target, they have to be very mindful because in the long run, inflation is what their policy toolkit is able to control. The labor market, of course, is a byproduct of how stable that inflationary dynamic is. So it remains a very key aspect of decision making, I think, for this committee. And Esther, I know it's an impossible question, but I am curious about where you think the neutral rate might be in this cycle, of course, in, in sort of a range. I mean, do you think that we're going back to a 2.5% neutral rate, or do you think that maybe it could be a little bit higher nowadays? Yeah, well, my view is that I think it is a little bit higher. And of course, we don't know. The economy is still trying to find an equilibrium, I would argue, as is the Fed, trying to judge. We don't want to stimulate the economy. We don't want to slow it down unnecessarily. But knowing where that neutral rate is um, is a tough call. And I believe you've heard the chairman say, we're going to kind of feel our way. We'll know it by its works. There are two things that I think, though, are important to look and why I would think that neutral rate is higher. One is looking at productivity growth. So that can bounce around, but we have seen some pretty uh, interesting productivity come out of this period. That could mean that that neutral rate is higher. And of course, the other thing is looking at fiscal policy. With the level of interest that's compounding and the deficits that we see underway right now, that could also suggest we're going to have higher levels of interest rates. And this idea that we will be going back pre-pandemic looks a little more uh, iffy to me than uh, the period we've just come off of. Now, I want to double down on just that point, because you were a co-signer to a report that came out this week from the Committee of a for a Responsible Federal Budget that says Vice President Harris, if elected, would add $3.5 trillion through the federal debt through 2035. President Trump would, however, add $7.5 trillion. No matter what, you have more, but it's the degree of how, more, uh, how much more you see through their policies. How much uncertainty does that add to the interest rate outlook, in addition to the current debt load that you were talking about? So for the Federal Reserve, they're not able to make decisions based on uh, those kinds of potential policy agendas. And of course, a lot will have to happen next year for us to see how that unfolds. I think what's really important, and I hope what the sentiment of this letter was, we're already in a place that we need to address our fiscal situation. And depending on how elections go and how Congress and policymakers think about the U.S. fiscal position, it will have dramatic implications for the country. And so the sooner those are addressed, the more specifically they're addressed, the better it will be in terms of tackling what is an enormous problem. We only have about 30 seconds left here, but do you think that there could even be a chance for an interest rate increase next year if these policies become inflationary? Well, I think under different scenarios, of course, uh, that could be an outcome because that, of course, is a direct mandate for the Federal Reserve is to try to head toward its 2% target. So a lot uh, can happen between now uh, and next year, and we'll have to stay tuned, as I know the Fed is. Esther George, we thank you so very much for your time. Of course, that is former Kansas City Fed President Esther George. Guys, back to you. All right, Shanali, thank you. And of course, we are less than four minutes away from the opening bell. Quick check on markets right now. Of course, you can see futures pretty much unchanged on the S&P 500, sort of taking a breather after the volatile two days that we had. We'll walk you through all of it once those bells ring. This is Bloomberg.
All right, we are moments away from the start of trading on this Wednesday. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. Right now, uh, futures are unchanged, really. But a very cool fact, I thought. I was watching to see if we could get back yesterday all that we lost on Monday. Indeed, we did exactly. Uh, we closed yesterday at 70, uh, 57.51, and that's where we closed on Friday night as well. Maybe that's not as interesting as I thought it was. Um, here you uh, hear the opening bells and you see the opening bells ringing in the New York Stock Exchange. This is interesting. Empire State Realty Trust ringing there and they're uh, uh, touting the Empire State run up. I imagine there's going to be a race where you run up all the stairs. I hope at least that's what it is. At the NASDAQ, um, you see AW New York, the Penn District ringing uh, the bell. So a lot of very cool people, some celebrities hanging out there. In terms of the averages, what's going to drive us today? What's going to weigh on us? Could it be? The fact that the Department of Justice has confirmed it is still considering the possibility of a breakup for Google, which it's been considering since the beginning of August and will consider until August of 2025. Let's go to Katie Greifeld. She'll tell us how that's affecting the indexes. You know, Matt, you make a compelling case, but I don't think that's quite it, of course. Uh, of course, Matt is being facetious here. You have a whole lot of nothing if you take a look at, of course, the first seconds of trading at your big benchmark level, the S&P 500 down a little bit. Same thing, too, if you take a look at the NASDAQ 100, your big tech stocks. But, of course, we're coming off two very volatile, volatile days. And the question is, I mean, what is going to be the catalyst here? Is it going to be earnings? Is it going to be the Fed? Of course, and we have the election 26 days away. But you add it all together right now, pretty quiet. Let's get to some stocks underneath the hood because we do have some action when it comes to Arcadium lithium of course rio tinto will rio tinto will buy that miner in an all-cash deal valued at 6.7 billion dollars the reason why you're seeing this big pop is because that's a 90 percent premium from arcadium's closing price last friday and as matt mentioned of course we are keeping an eye on alphabet the justice department may ask a judge to force the tech giant to break up its business over concerns of monopolization of the internet search and ad space bloomberg news and other outlets of course have been following this very closely it's been a wait on the stock for the last three months and as such maybe not a huge surprise today you can see the stock pretty much unchanged matt all right, uh, so not moving the price at all, but still a very interesting story. Also, Boeing has withdrawn its contract offer with the union that's been on strike for nearly a month. The impasse leaves both sides with no clear path forward, as S&P Global says it may cut the plane maker's credit rating to junk. Let's talk about that with Bloomberg Global Aviation Editor Benedict Kamel. Uh, and Benny, it's interesting, you know, um, even though they're going to lose, Boeing will lose, I guess, $1.5 billion a month. Um, at least that's what J.P. Morgan estimates, as long as this strike goes on. They're not really over a barrel the way the ports were with the longshoremen, so they're not in a huge hurry to finish this strike. Well, it depends who you talk to. S&P made pretty clear yesterday that they, there is a certain uh, urgency to the talks. Um, S&P predicts that it's about a billion that's rushing uh, out of, out of uh, Boeing's um, coffers every month. Um, so, and this is a company that already came into this uh, strike uh, financially weakened. You know, they, they've been losing cash since the start of the year. And, and, and the question really is, who blinks first? Uh, they came into the talks on Monday, uh, the unions and Boeing, uh, and it was looking kind of hopeful they would get back to the table at the very least after two weeks of no talks. And now here we are two days later, and they've broken off again. Um, so it's unclear what will bring them back, who's going to feel more pressure. As you said, Boeing does have some pressure um, in terms of the finances, but so do the workers. You know, they, they no longer get their paychecks, the health benefits. Uh, have ended. So at some point, something will have to give. Well, to your point, I would imagine, and who am I, but I would imagine that Boeing feels more urgency here when you think about that incredible cash drain, of course, S&P Global knocking on the door saying, hey, we might downgrade you. And on the union side, I mean, I imagine that the leadership is taking a look at the enormous raises that the longshoremen just secured and saying, why not us? Yeah, I mean there is a bit of a there is a bit of a gap between what uh, what was just achieved on the port side and, and the numbers that are out there on on the Boeing side. Uh, the last Boeing offer now uh, taken back was 30% wage increase. Uh, that's obviously just about half of of what the the harbour workers achieved. Um, the 
the workers want something closer to 40%, and that's probably a number that they can agree on. The sticking point really is not so much the, the, the wages, but the pensions. That's something that the, uh, the workers want reinstated in all, an old pension plan that they lost during the last wage talks. And that to Boeing is a real red line. And that might also be the, the reason why talks broke down again and Boeing made very clear, we cannot follow you in that demand. Uh, they said that, uh, that the workers wanted something that wouldn't have been viable for Boeing if they wanted to stay in business. So that probably is their red line. And at some point, the workers might come around for now, it looks like a fairly uniform uh, sort of uh, approach. But at some point, particularly younger workers might say, you know what, 35 40%, that doesn't look so bad. And I'd rather do that and get the money than be camping out here for another couple of months you know, as, as winter approaches. So if Boeing can drive some kind of a wedge into the worker front, then they might have an edge. All right, Benny, great reporting, great context, as always. That is Bloomberg's Benedict Kamel reporting on Boeing. Of course, shares down another 3.5% today, down more than 40% in 2024. Just amazing to watch that. Meanwhile, let's broaden out this conversation and bring in Max Kettner. He is HSBC chief multi-asset strategist. And, of course, over here in the States, we're taking a look at CPI tomorrow. And after that blowout jobs report that we got last week, feels like the stakes have been raised on CPI. You had Bank of America coming out and saying that stocks, they can withstand a slight upside surprise in inflation, but a sizable surprise that might be too much to stomach. How are you thinking about the balance of risks as we count down? Yeah, good morning and good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, look, I think on the CPI, probably the narrative has changed so much and shifted so much that a couple of basis points of an upside surprise, even on the headline, would already be enough to sort of really keep the trade going that we've had uh, ever since last week, or really the last week and a half. So a bit more sort of a reversal of Q3, long the cyclicals, short the bond proxies, short the defensives, uh, you know, really, really long on equities and on the cyclicals against U.S. rates in particular that are still not really priced for uh, the U.S. actually still being in a really good place from a, from a growth perspective. Um, so I think a couple of basis points here, uh, a bit of an upside surprise tomorrow is already enough to just put a bit more fuel on the fire of that. I wouldn't, however, say that there's a big potential for an, an enormous upside surprise, particularly on the headline, given that oil prices up until a couple of days ago, of course, have been fairly, you know, fairly range bound to slightly down. So if anything, that probably should keep uh, the headline somewhere close to 0.1 on the month. And let's talk a little bit more about defenses, which you bring up, because actually Bill Gross, of course, released his latest investment outcome a little bit earlier this morning. He's the bond king, but he talks about stocks now, and he's shifting to defensive stocks. He says that it's no bear market, but it's not the same bull market anymore. And as such, he recommends keeping exposure at average levels, but focusing on defensive stocks here. Talk us through a little bit what you see as the different push-pull factors in defensives. Uh, on that, I must be very honest, I could not disagree more. I think this is not the time to go into defensives. Um, I think one of the things that really is massively underappreciated still is when we look at the last uh, week and a half, where we had the revisions to the national accounts data in the U.S., quite frankly, never in my life have I ever seen a set of data, a set of revisions, where every single subset of the data was revised higher, whether that is GDP or gross domestic income, whether that was profit, Remember, profits were revised higher by almost 12%. You know, you had incomes revised higher, dividend income, interest income, wages and salaries. Every single thing has been revised higher. So savings as well, right? We thought that excess savings would be running out. And look at the savings rate. It's like below 3%. So under the hood, the U.S. consumer is feeling much more of a strain already. Well, the reality is that the savings rate is above 5%. So it does look that the U.S. consumer is in a much, much better state. And... When we look at consumer spending, debit card spending, look at the Chicago Fed's weekly uh, retail sales, look at weekly same-store retail sales, all of that stuff has been picking up since early August. So, frankly, I think we've been massively underestimating how strong the U.S. economy is. I think we've all been massively overestimating that uh, payroll number, that, that July payroll number. And I think a lot of people are now sort of really forced into unwinding those Q3 trades. And, and therefore, I think that cyclical trade, particularly combined with you guys been talking about what is the next catalyst, particularly combined with the earnings season now coming up. Mm. And let's remember, if you exclude, for example, tech from, from consensus earnings expectations, 
that earnings are actually expected to decline quarter on quarter in an environment where GDP probably has gone up by almost 6% nominal GDP, which is, which is just crazy. So you've got such an utterly low bar to beat on, on earnings expectations that, frankly, I think really the place to be is cyclical now. So, Matt, Max disagrees with Bill Gross, but you have to remember, Bill Gross is a bond guy. He's biased to be defensive here and to be a little bit scared. Also, Bill has been, and Max is up and coming. Yeah. Max, what do you think about the, uh, uh, the, the Fed path here? You know, 50 basis points. After that, I thought maybe there's a chance they go again. There are some economists um, who were saying, I think Michael Feroli, you know, if we get a big miss on the labor number, you could see another 50 in November. And that, I would think, just supports your bullishness for stocks. Now that we get the blowout jobs number and the revisions up, I feel like the Fed doesn't really have to do 50 or even 25. I mean, they could um, do just one more rate cut this year and it would be fine, especially if inflation um, it, it surprises to the upside a little bit. Is it a threat to your bull case if we have rates you know, not being cut as quickly? No, I don't think so. I think, yes, the case for 50 certainly is no longer there, but I think for the Fed to even stop with rate cuts at all, even in November, would be a complete shift from what they've said in Jackson Hole, what they've said during the September meeting, what Powell has just said last week. So it would be a very sudden shift away from that. And let's remember, the inflation outlook hasn't changed suddenly overnight. So it's not like everything's gone suddenly way more hawkish. So a series of 25 basis point cuts is really still makes sense, at least the next couple of meetings. And that is still really good for stocks. Let's remember that the last, let's say, two years, where did stocks, where did spreads, where did risk assets really get under pressure? It was the pain point always was reached when you basically were switching from, OK, they're probably not going to cut at all, and they may even have to hike. That was always the pain point. That was April, May this year. It was August, September, October last year. It was never really, well, they're going to cut a bit less than we thought. That's totally fine. Equity, spreads, risk assets in general are totally fine with that. I think once the narrative changes to actually this is it, they're not going to cut at all and or they may even have to hike. That is the pain point where I think risk assets will really start to struggle. And quite frankly, we're far away from that point. Max, great such base with you. Love to get your take. Max Kettner there is chief multi-asset strategist at the Hong Kong Shanghai uh, Banking Corporation. When we come back, we're going to get more from Shanali at Citadel. This is Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Basik, and this is Bloomberg Open Interest here today at the Citadel Securities Global Macro Conference. And I am with the market makers, global head of rates, Mike DePass. You have about 150 clients here, hedge funds, asset managers, institutions, central banks, a lot of central bankers, even former politicians here today. How has Citadel Securities grown and evolved? This used to be a company mostly known for equity market making, but very noticeably pushing hard into the world of rates and credit. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sonali. So we're really, really proud of, of the growth of our franchise over the last uh, really eight years. Uh, the focus for us of late has been launching our credit business, which has been uh, phenomenal. We're off to a great start, making a real market impact there. Uh, Elsewhere in fixed income, we're focused on our European rates expansion. We expect to be fully live in Europe across a variety of products by the end of the year. Uh, and also, really, the biggest evolution for us as a franchise has been that deepening of relationships with exactly those clients that you mentioned, where we are now seen as a trusted liquidity provider, source of liquidity for large risk transfers, complex trades, really adding value to our clients in, in the way that they really, really need. You're getting a very intimate place in the marketplace right now, and we're less than 24 hours, as I sit with you today, from that next inflation print, presumably the next big market moment. Yeah. What is your expectation? So it, it's quite interesting because the market had shifted all of its focus and really all of its vol expectations into uh, the payroll reports going forward with an expectation that they would be weak and it would sort of force the, the Fed to be more aggressive than maybe we had initially thought. 
Now we've seen a quite strong payroll report last week, and the, the attention now turns to inflation once again, where you say, well, the growth dynamic now looks pretty solid. Do we have to be concerned about inflation maybe not getting to target? How does it change the Fed reaction function? So for tomorrow, we're looking for a print that puts core in the high 20s, uh, gets you to an inflation environment around two and a half, three percent, still well above target, uh, and still leaving the Fed with a, a dual mandate to manage. Well, so what does that mean in terms of your expectation for how much the Fed can cut rates this year? Yeah, so right now we see the market and, and it's repriced materially, uh, but we're still implying 50 basis points of cuts uh, for this year. And I think when we look at it, uh, whether it's the strength of the underlying economy or the stickiness on the inflation front, that feels a bit too high. So I'll go out on a limb and say we only end up seeing 25 basis points of cuts again for the rest of the year. That's a call. And it's interesting. You have seen more folks turn tactically short in the market, as our own Bloomberg's Liz McCormick points out. Do you think that implies that people can be short even further, given where the market is now and what you expect, which is only 25? Yeah, it certainly would have an impact uh, on the very short end of, uh, of the curve. Uh, so there's, there's room to trade this market tactically, and I think that's really going to be the biggest message and biggest dynamic going forward is the economy is in uh, a bit of an inflection point. There are a lot of cross currents, and I think you're going to get an opportunity to trade what we expect to be material volatility going forward. Material volatility, it was incredible. A year ago when we sat here, your clients had an incredible range of outlook comes yeah. here for what the short end would look like. What does that look like going into the end of next year? We had Esther George apparently saying you can't even really rule out a hike next year. Yeah. Well, I think getting the Fed in, in a position where they would consider hikes is going to be quite difficult. I think what's much more likely is we end up in a world where inflation remains sticky above target and the pace of easing slows down relative to what uh, the market has priced in. But again, I think the opinions are so wide and so varied that we're once again going to see a market that responds aggressively, likely over responds aggressively to one or two data points. And we're going to get quite a wide range again in, in the front end of the curve. And call it the Citadel Securities spread this year. Michael yeah. DePass, thank you so much for joining us. Looking forward to the rest of the conference. Katie, back to you. All right, Shanali, thank you. Of course, Shanali, we'll have more from the Citadel Securities Global Macro Conference throughout the day, including an interview with the CEO of Citadel Securities. Coming up on this program, will they or won't they? Kushtard has a fresh proposal for the owner of 7-Eleven stores. We'll bring you the latest in M&A next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Open Interest. Let's take a check on stocks. Of course, 22 minutes since those bells rang and not a lot is happening. If you take a look at the S&P 500, currently flat on the day, a little bit more action to the downside when it comes to your big tech names, currently off by about two tenths of a percent on the NASDAQ 100 and your small caps, the Russell 2000, hanging in, holding steady rather. You take a look at the Russell 2000, I'm going to call that flat too. Meanwhile, let's move to M&A land because we do have some action there. When it comes to Kushtard, it has sent the owner of 7-Eleven stores a fresh offer worth $47 billion. The Canadian company still trying to take over the Japanese retailer after its initial bid was rejected. Joining us now is Bloomberg Deals reporter Crystal C. And this is a 20% premium to their previous offer. They really want this company. Hang on, can we also just congratulate Katie for saying Kushtard correctly? I hate saying that. On I, the first try. I had to put it phonetically in the prompter. Kushtard? Kushtard. Right, I, right, right. I don't know. Anyway. You got it right. Thank uh, you. <laughs> So it went from 1486 uh, to 1890. So it's a it's it's a significant bump, and it shows that you know Kushtar is still there. They still really want to go for this. There was a little bit of like, will they, won't they? At one point, uh, will they actually? Kushtar doesn't have like the most the smoothest, uh, mo most flawless uh, M&A track record. They have mm -hmm. approached many big things. If you remember, like uh, Carrefour was one of them. There are a bunch of European assets that they've looked at. So this one is showing that they're back. They really want to do it, but. The reality is not a lot has changed. Mm. The, the previous bit was rejected, and they have an open book. They haven't seen any more information since the last bit. So it's, it's going to be whatever they see from now on. It's going to determine what's the next step. I read I, what I found fascinating uh, about 7&I, which owns obviously 7-Eleven. We're showing some Japanese 7-Eleven 
uh, footage there, but also the Circle K and um, they have applied for and received uh, core company status in Japan, meaning they're vital to the national security of Japan. Is this like retaliation for U.S. steel or what's going on? So the, the, the argument here is there's a hurricane going on in, in the U.S. There are a lot of tsunamis, typhoons that happen in Japan. And when those things happen, 7-Eleven as a retailer, because of the span that they have in the country, they're essential in distributing emergency supply to the Japanese. Wait, so the 7-Eleven workers, if there's a tsunami, they're still coming into work they're still and handing out like Starburst. Whatever Hot whatever dogs. supply yeah. you need, your karage, you know, your whatever cup noodle that you want, like you can still find it at 7-Eleven. It could be trickled down from like the, the government, but you know, like just because of their footprint, they play a very essential role in the Japanese society. Not to mention it's a lower cost food alternative mm -hmm. for a lot of, you know, uh, so not retaliation man. for U.S. steel. I mean, you can look at it both ways. Yeah. An official party line, that's not, that's not what they're Got looking it. for. All right, we have less than a minute left with you, but 7 and I, it's scheduled to report its results today, actually. I would imagine that they're going to face some questions about why they are saying no and whether they'll say no to this one. Yeah, they haven't really said anything this time, like after the bump. Um, so after earnings, it's also interesting to see what Kusha would think. Um, you know, based on the performance of the quarter, um, again, like they haven't really seen anything in private. Numbers wise, they really have to rely on today's um, data. All right, Kushtar obviously is Canadian. Uh, right. Anyway, so I guess it wouldn't really be retaliation, but is it <laughs> Quebecois? North America. Yeah, North yeah. American North retaliation. America. Crystal, thanks so much. Crystal C covers the deals for us. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to talk to uh, this, uh, the VP of FICO scores about the uptick in missed credit payments. Then Admiral James Stravitis joins us with his new book and talk about geopolitical risks. This is Bloomberg. We are 30 minutes into the trading day. Welcome to Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Chanali Basic on assignment. And coming up, geopolitics keeping investors on edge. We'll navigate the uncertain climate with Admiral James Stavridis. He is a retired four-star U.S. Naval officer. Also, tracking Milton, Florida braces itself for the impact of another major storm just two weeks after Helene battered the southeast. And now there's new technology that could make homes more resistant to hurricanes. We'll speak with Kevin Murphy. He is CEO of Ferguson, a supplier of building materials. Meanwhile, I take a look at markets 30 minutes into the trading day. As Matt said, a little bit more action when it comes to the S&P 500 of about a tenth of a percent, but really taking a breather after the start to this week where we went down mightily, up mightily yesterday, currently just a tenth of a percent higher. The Nasdaq 100, a little bit lower, tenth of a percent, not too much uh, movement there. We'll continue to track that. Meanwhile, the bond market pretty well behaved. You do have 10-year yields a little bit higher, up about three basis points. But of course, they broke above 4%, and they've been hovering there for the last couple days. Meanwhile, moving on, some new data coming out on the health of the U.S. consumer. The average U.S. FICO credit score has steadied at 717. The report also found that consumers are still under pressure as missed payment rates and borrow balances rise. Joining us with more insight, I am pleased to say we're joined now by Ethan Dornhelm. He is FICO VP of Scores and Predictive Analytics. And uh, we'll get to the missed payments because that's really interesting. But I just want to start with the credit score. 717, I think that would surprise a lot of people, of course, and it's held steady over the past few readings, which is also interesting. Talk us through that resilience and what's lending itself to that. Yeah, thanks, Katie. I, you know, the first thing I would note is that 717 is materially higher than the average U.S. FICO score in early 2020, just prior to the pandemic. We saw an unprecedented increase in average FICO score in the first year of the pandemic as consumers benefited from programs aimed at mitigating the impacts of COVID, whether that was government stimulus, enhanced unemployment benefits, lender payment accommodations, all of those things allowed consumers to really uh, save in unprecedented levels, pay down debt, pay bills on time, and all of that translated to a significant increase in average FICO score for U.S. consumers in the first year of the pandemic. Since then, we've really seen, as you said, a leveling off. 
of that average FICO score, a somewhat stable period. And I think it's sort of a story of equal and, 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 and opposite forces. On the one hand, we are starting to see some consumers exhibit increasing signs of financial strain in the form of missed payments, in the form of ramped up debt. And yet at the same time, over 160 million U.S. consumers are still paying their bills as agreed, showing no fine signs of financial strain as of yet. So um, I have a couple technical questions. Ethan, is that a mean or a median average? Matt Winkler taught me the difference and its importance. And um, why do we only get data from October, uh, April, and I guess the most recent is July? Do you not have a real-time look at uh, this, what is I, I'm guessing, an aggregate of three credit bureaus' ratings? I'll start with the mean and median question. Great question. Uh, this is a mean calculation. We also do look at the median calculation, and it generally moves in a very similar fashion to the mean or average, which is why we report average out to the market. As far as why we only report in wait, what, wait, April, what is what is the median? Ooh, you know, I don't have that stat off the top of my head, Matt. Okay, um, but gen generally speaking, it's a little bit lower uh, than the mean. Excuse me, a little bit higher. Yeah. Than than me. Um, but all that said, uh, with regards to why we only report on a certain cadence, part of it is because the average U.S. FICO score is much more an ocean liner than a speedboat as far as how often and how quickly it changes. So uh, in a typical year, we're not going to see much more than a movement of a couple of points in either direction, which made that eight point increase in the first year of the pandemic so unprecedented. So if the if the mean is a little bit higher, I'm guessing that most people are above, well, I mean, it automatically uh, tells me that most people are, are, are above it. And um, the grouping of low scores is just a big clump in the bottom. Can you tell us if the lowest quartile or, or, or two quintiles or whatever is having more problems? Yeah, again, we are sort of seeing this equal and opposite forces effect. We are seeing a small uptick in the number of consumers scoring in the very lowest um, score ranges, say less than 600. At the same time, I would emphasize when we talk about rising missed payment rates, we're talking about, say, one out of every 100 borrowers incrementally mm. missing payments. So it's still being largely offset by the overwhelming majority of consumers who continue to make their payments as agreed. Well, let's build on that a little bit, Ethan. Of course, you mentioned that these average scores, they're more like an ocean liner. It takes time to really uh, change the trend there. But you mentioned, of course, those missed payments on the rise. Looking through your notes as well, consumer debt levels are rising as well. When does that start to bite? You mentioned, of course, that some of these numbers are incremental. But when do we start to see that show up in the averages, if at all? Well, we already have, to a certain degree, um, uh, I think there's a Bloomberg article out today that highlights the fact that just last year, we actually saw the average FICO score decrease by just one point, but decrease uh, for the first time in over a decade. So we are starting to see certainly those missed payments and that rising debt level has blunted the upward momentum we had seen in the average FICO score for, for many years. And uh, it's interesting, if you take a look at the historical data, in October 2005, the average score was 688. Of course, the average now 717, as we've mentioned. So it's been steadily rising, if you zoom out, over the past couple de decades. And I find that interesting, Ethan. And I'm wondering, what are sort of the dynamics that got us to that steady rise? Is that just the upper quintile becoming higher and higher quality? Or walk us through it a little bit. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's a number of factors. First of all, coming out of the Great Recession, we had a period of 10 years of, of very stable economic growth. And so it, it wasn't too surprising to see accompanying that a period of stable growth in the average U.S. FICO score. I think there's also been great strides made in consumer education and empowerment around their credit report and around their FICO score, including at our consumer web portal, myfico.com, where consumers can understand what factors are impacting their score, how they can drive their score higher through their credit behaviors, and even simulate what happens if I pay off this bill or what happens if I miss this payment. Very cool stuff. Um, I think it's fair to say Katie and I are both a little bit obsessed with <laughs> this issue. And uh, it was great having you on, Ethan. Thanks so much for joining us. Hope you come back. Ethan Dornhelm there of FICO talking about consumer credit scores. Let's get now a look at stocks.
moving at this hour. There is more movement, obviously, under the hood than there is on the surface. Abigail Doolittle is here to tell us what she's looking at. Abby? Well, there's certainly a lot of movement for the shares of uh, WW International or the old Weight Watchers right now up 23% up for a fourth day in a row over the last four days. Basically a double. Now that said, it is a stock that's trading at a dollar. 43, but for a beleaguered company, one example of that, the CEO uh, recently leaving. Today, good news that I think that this stock was trading up into. Uh, they are offering a new compounded GLP-1 offering. It will be a part of their $129 program. On the other hand, Barclays is saying this is probably not enough, but investors will take it given some of the bad news recently. Another stock trading higher, Helen of Troy. Uh, well, actually, if we take a look at China tech stocks, we have a continuation of the declines from the day before Alibaba and JD.com, both down more than 2%. And this, of course, is China said that it is watching the economy, wants to support growth, but isn't offering new stimulus. Yesterday, the HXC or the NASDAQ Golden Dragon Index down more than 10%, the worst day since 2008. So a little bit of a continuation again. And Las Vegas Sands, one of those gaming stocks, down 1.1%. That exposure to Macau and the idea that less stimulus into the Chinese economy means uh, that we're going to have fewer consumers, Chinese consumers consumers going over there to gamble. And then finally, maybe we have Helen of Troy here, maybe we don't, but in any case, it is popping sharply higher. Yes, we do, up 23%. The owner of brands such as VIX and uh, Honeywell, they put up a much stronger quarter than expected, Katie, beating both sales and earnings, earnings by 13%. All right, Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. Now coming up, President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu set to speak today. We'll discuss the geopolitical landscape with Admiral James Stavridis. He is the Carlyle Group Vice Chairman of Global Affairs. Next, this is Bloomberg. Getting out of high interest to look at what's making headlines around the world. Salaries on Wall Street are dropping even further from the heights they reached during the pandemic. The average salary was $471,000, including bonuses, according to the annual report from the New York State Comptroller. That's down 5% from the previous year, uh, more like 9% when you adjust for inflation. And the Kremlin confirms that former U.S. President Donald Trump sent Russian President Vladimir Putin COVID-19 testing devices during the height of the pandemic while he was in the White House. The detail is in a new book by Bob Woodward of Watergate fame. And Israel's defense minister has postponed his trip to Washington. Yoav Gallant was expected to meet with his U.S. counterpart, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, to discuss Israel's response to Iran's missile barrage last week. The Pentagon played down any suggestion of tension between the two sides, leading to the postponement. The rising geopolitical tensions uh, quickly becoming headwinds for investors. Emily Bowersock Hill, CEO and founding partner of Bowersock Capital Partners, yesterday joined us with her thoughts. There are shades of 1939 and 1913, and not to be melodramatic, but the, we certainly are seeing heightened geopolitical risks, which could be a significant setback. For more on this, we're joined by Admiral James Stavridis, the Carlyle Group Vice Chairman of Global Affairs. He's a former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, a Bloomberg Opinion columnist, and his latest book, The Restless Wave, hit shelves yesterday. It addresses the beginnings of uh, World <laughs> War II, which is what Emily was referencing uh, with 1939. Um, Stavridis' latest Bloomberg Opinion piece addressed the Mideast conflict that we're looking at now, um, titled in his Israel-Iran war would be a deadly mess. Um, there's so many things, Admiral, that we could talk about with you. I want to start uh, with Emily Bowersock's comments. I mean, do you think that we could be on the precipice of World War III here? She didn't want to go that far, but clearly those are the comparisons that she was making. Um, I think, as she said, she's not intending to be uh, melodramatic. I don't think we're on the verge of a 1939-like global meltdown in any sense. What I do think, and you alluded to it just a moment ago, is the Middle East, which feels at times like it's on fire, Israel fighting a four- or five-front war, depending on how you want to score it. And uh, without question, the 
The specter there is of a wide Israel-Iran full-on war. Um, I think the chances of that are probably somewhere around one in four. And final thought, if that happens, it is highly likely the Iranians would close the Strait of Hormuz, at least temporarily. The perturbations through the global economy in that scenario would be significant. I think that's the closest we are to a 1939-like moment. You know, when you talk about the uh, number of fronts Israel faces, um, it dawns on me that most of them are really just Iran, right? I mean, Hamas, oh, yeah. Hezbollah, yes. the Houthis, all supported financially by Iran. They don't want us to say it's Israel versus Iran, um, but it really is. Why don't we just come out and support an Israeli attack of, for example, Iranian uh, nuclear facilities, since clearly the only reason they have nuclear facilities is to build a bomb? Uh, the short answer to the question is we are encouraging Israel. We have uh, validated their strong reaction to the 200 ballistic missile attack they endured six days ago, and they will strike. The question is... Will it be, as you postulate, at the nuclear sites? I think that's a defendable proposition. Um, but the problem with going after those nuclear sites, it's a very hard target set. Um, Iran is three times the size of Texas. There are 25 at least of these sites. Those are the ones we know about. And several of them, the critical ones, are buried under 300 feet of concrete mountain, much like Cheyenne Mountains installation in the United States out in Colorado. So a really hard target set. So if I'm an Israeli general advising Prime Minister Netanyahu, I would say, let's go after the military industrial complex. Let's go after the factories where they produce the ballistic missiles, the storage, the maintenance, all of that. It's a little less psychologically satisfying, perhaps, but it's an easier target set. Iran's still a year away, at least, from a deliverable nuclear weapon. If they get closer to it, I would postulate the U.S. and Israel will then strike together. Mm -hmm. Not necessary now. Let the Israelis go in and do the shot I just described. I think that's what you'll see in the next few days. Yeah, it's a great point, too. You think about the logistics of such an attack, and they're pretty difficult. I do want to go to your latest for Bloomberg Opinion, of course. As Matt said, it's titled, In Israel, Iran War Would Be a Deadly Mess. And you ask a series of pretty somber questions. One of them is, would the U.S. inevitably be drawn into a conflict? Should a true regional war actually break out in the Middle East? And I'll flip that question to you. Do you think it's inevitable? I do. Um, we have stood with Israel for decades. I think we'll continue to do so. Let, let's remember who got us into the position we're in right now. Uh, a year ago yesterday, Israel was brutally attacked by a terrorist organization that killed 1,200 Israelis, which would be like an equivalent attack in the United States, population adjusted, of 35,000 killed. Israel has every right to respond to that. We will continue to support them against the tentacles of the octopus, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, the militias in Syria. Ultimately, we will support their strike against Iran, and in my view, we should do so. I want to ask you about the strategy, because um, at the time, it seemed, mm -hmm. and you could still see it that way, as if Hamas was simply trying to draw Israel into a trap. They knew that they would <laughs> uh, be forced to retaliate. Israel has done that and now killed, I think, more than 40,000 people, at least according to the Hamas health ministry in Gaza. Many of them, you know, defenseless women <laughs> and children, they're attacking in Lebanon. They're being drawn possibly into a war with Iran. Wasn't there another choice? Was there a better choice, Admiral, for, for Israel to respond? I think Israel had to respond with uh, maximalist force. Um, could they unwind some level of the collateral damage? Perhaps. I know the Israeli Defense Force as well. I've been uh, integrated and served alongside Israeli officers when I was on active duty. They are a modern army that seeks to reduce collateral damage, unlike Hamas, which deliberately wants to inflict as much 
pain, mutilation, torture, and rape upon its victims, two very different circumstances. What I will say is that Israel, um, as it continues on uh, in Lebanon against Hezbollah, is drawing on the lessons they've learned operating in Hamas. I think they will reduce collateral damage overall, but these are two campaigns that fell out of terrorist attacks by Hamas a year ago. It's not going to stop in the immediate future. Um, longer term, final thought here, longer term, strategically, you asked, um, Israel needs to get closer to the Arab world, to work with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, to fulfill what began in the Trump administration with the Abraham Accords, pull the Saudis closer, get recognition, ultimately get an Arab peacekeeping force into Gaza. That's the strategic way forward. And Admiral, I can't say how great it is to get your thoughts, your perspective, of course, on what's going on right now. But while we have you, let's talk about the book that's behind you. Of course, The Restless Wave Hitting Shelves. It's your latest work. It's a work of fiction based in the 1940s. Of course, you're an accomplished author at this point. What can your readers expect to find in this book? Yeah, this is my 14th book and my third novel. Um, and I wrote it because of a quote from Winston Churchill, who said, the further into the future you want to see, the more you need to look to the past. Those are pretty profound words. And I thought by writing a novel set in the early 1940s, that is a love triangle, the backdrop of war. It is also a book about great power conflict in the Pacific. And it's a war about new technology sweeping the battlefield, all loosely based on Dante's Inferno. There's a lot going on in this novel. But I think it will help readers understand and think about what Emily said in that great quote you showed us previously about, are we in a 1939 moment? We don't have to imagine what that looked like. Pick up the restless wave. You'll see a world about to be set fire. And Admiral, we only have less than a minute left, but I certainly find it inspiring, and I'm sure others do as well, that you write fiction as well. And I'm curious, I mean, what advice might you have for an aspiring fiction novelist? Um, the beauty of writing fiction is that you can throw off the shackles of fact and you can build a coherent thematic work. And here's the key. People love stories and they want to hear stories of real humans that they can relate to by using storytelling set in the world of fiction you can actually make powerful points about geopolitics, economics, and the human condition. All right, Admiral, sadly, we have to leave it there. So enjoyed this conversation. Really appreciate you taking the time. That, of course, is Admiral James Stavridis of the Carlyle Group and, of course, the author of The Restless Wave. This is Bloomberg. Investors in catastrophe bonds are preparing for substantial losses, um, first from Hurricane Helene and now Hurricane Milton. Put volume on insurance companies are, is at its highest level since May when a windstorm tore through parts of Texas. This is the storm continues to barrel through uh, or towards the west coast of Florida. Um, joining us now is Matthew Palazzola, Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst. Uh, to talk about, I guess, how much damage we expect, Matthew, and how much of that is actually covered by insurance. Yeah, so what you're going to see here, Matt and Katie, is a lot of storm surge from uh, Milton. They're talking about 15 feet in Tampa Bay. Home insurance policies will typically exclude storm surge. So that could be a big portion of this loss that goes uninsured or insured by the uh, National Flood Insurance Program. There are numbers in the industry kind of floating around if this could be a hundred billion dollar event i'm not exactly sure on that That's yet milton specifically right because i remember seeing a note from you on helene just uh two weeks ago that that could have been a hundred billion dollar event as well so yeah i mean helene is is going to be much smaller this is just milton and this is just insurance losses so the economic losses could be much higher than that 
Well, let's get specific here and talk about some of the actual insurers here. When you think about who is most exposed, what names pop to mind? So the thing about the Florida market is it's been a bad market for a long time. So mm -hmm. the most exposed companies are the smaller regional uh, home insurers. We don't really cover them, but those stocks are down like 20%. Wow. The big names we cover, Allstate Progressive, Chubb, AIG, they will have losses, but not significant compared to those uh, smaller names. The stocks of all of them kind of went down and then rebounded back up because I think the, the initial market reaction was probably a little overblown. But is it that because they just don't underwrite as much uh, property there? Exactly, Matt. They, so the, the, all the national companies have shied away from this market. It's been a lot of fraud in the state. So people think maybe, oh, it's the hurricanes affecting it all the time. It's not necessarily that. It was a lot of fraud in Florida that was pushing up claims costs. So this company said, we could underwrite weather risk. We just can't under, underwrite this regulatory risk. All right. Well, Matthew, always great to check in with you, get your perspective. I know you've been a busy man. That is Matthew Palazzola of Bloomberg Intelligence. And for more on the hurricane, let's keep the conversation going now with Kevin Murphy. He is the CEO of Ferguson. And Ferguson, of course, is one of the world's largest suppliers of building materials. And of course, as we think about the combined forces of Hurricane Helene just two weeks ago and the potential devastation that Hurricane Milton might uh, cause. If you think about Florida, you were mentioning in the in the commercial break that that's a big market for Ferguson. What will the rebuilding process look like and what might that mean for Ferguson? Yeah, thank you for having me. And, and we start by the heartbreak that we have for the people in Western North Carolina. And uh, we certainly are thinking about what's going to happen with the residents all across the state of Florida with Milton. And, and for us as a company, you know, it's probably one of the times that I feel the most proud to be associated with our organization because we really mobilize after an event like this, after a natural disaster or crisis, and make sure that we're mobilizing truckloads of water, portable showers, generators, fuel trucks to make sure that not only do we take care of our associates in the area, but we're also part of the recovery effort for the market in the community. And so you're right, in the state of Florida, we have a fairly concentrated position across a branch network throughout the state of Florida. It's been a great place for us for our business, which means we have a great many associates there. And so we'll do the same thing that we did with Helene in terms of mobilizing and taking care of our associates in our communities. And then as we go through the rebuilding process, we'll be a part of everything from water and wastewater remediation, stormwater remediation, all the way up through when people renovate their homes and and businesses through mechanical systems, plumbing, lighting, appliances to get those homes and businesses rebuilt. How much um, rebuilding do you expect to have to do, Kevin? I mean, um, it's going to be obviously a lot of people will need repairs. A lot of people are going to need entirely new systems, right? What, what are your estimates in terms of the demands that are going to be placed on Ferguson? Yeah, and really it depends on the event and the extent of the event and where it happens. Uh, I mean, if you look back, we're, we're part of natural disaster recovery across the board. When they had ice storms in Texas and it caused a tremendous amount of damage in replacement or need for replacement of water heaters, for example, we would mobilize supplies, make sure that they're ready for the individual market and we can take care of that rebuilding effort. If I think back to when Hurricane Ian happened, mm -hmm. uh, we were in the middle of supply chain pressures. And so some of the things like appliances and the supply chain affected areas, we needed to mobilize around the country to make sure that we could take care of that rebuilding effort uh, in the state of Florida. So for better or worse, you do have experience here. And let's talk a little bit more about Ferguson, because, of course, a lot of people think about the destruction and they think about residential homes. But your business, my understanding is you're pretty evenly divided between residential and non-residential. And you think about this rebuilding effort that will start. Is there any way to anticipate where you'll be more involved when you think about those two sides? You're right. We are pretty evenly distributed. If you think about who our core customer is, for the most part, it is the specialized professional, the plumbing contractor, the HVAC contractor, the mechanical contractor or utility contractor. Our business is just over half residential, just under half non-residential, with about two thirds being repair, replace, remodel and the rest being new construction. And so we're involved in all aspects. You think about 
the power of water and the power of storm surge that you were talking about with your previous guests. We're involved in stormwater construction with local municipalities and state agencies to make sure that we've got urban green infrastructure, to make sure that we've got permeable pavement and the stormwater retention necessary to mitigate that damage. And so we're really doing everything from that all the way through the residential and non-residential rebuilding side of what a natural disaster can look like. You know, um, I don't want to get too philosophical, but I always <laughs> think about Bastiat and the broken window fallacy, um, which is that maybe it's not good to replace uh, old, old things that are destroyed. On the other hand, Joseph Schumpeter has uh, his creative destruction theory, um, which says that innovations uh, are important I think of HVAC systems in this way as well, because, you know, people who have old air movers are using R22 refrigerant, which is now banned, um, but they haven't many, most, I would guess, have not updated. Um, do you see a lot of innovation or, you know, even sort of a greener technology coming in when you replace old equipment with new? We do, and, and HVAC is a fairly large piece of our business. We've got a multi-billion dollar HVAC business, and the majority of that, call it 75% of that, is in the replacement side of the world. And so what we're seeing right now is, as consumers may have to make choices in terms of how they spend their money, it's a bit more on the repair side than what we historically would see. But when we look forward, the regulatory environment, the energy efficiency side of the equation will drive innovation, will drive innovation on that air conditioning efficiency perspective. And so we think that's going to be uh, an attractive market for us for years to come. And we also think that as technology changes and as these systems become more advanced, we'll actually see a joining together of the trade plumbing contractor who does water heater replacement, which is also part of that efficiency move with that HVAC technician that does repair and replace for HVAC systems. And so we see that innovation as being a positive thing, not only for our industry, but also for energy efficiency in the consumer's home. And Kevin, I don't have any philosophers to quote to you, but I do want to talk about the housing market uh, and go back to that conversation on residential, because I'm looking through your most recent earnings report, and I know that the residential end market was a little bit weak, and we know that the housing market has been a really weird place to be, of course. You think about the chronic undersupply of housing and then the fact that interest rates are so high that people aren't really moving around so much. And I'm curious, from where you sit, how much do you think rates need to go down from here before we see a meaningful shot in the arm to the housing market? We, ha we have been in a residential recession, so to speak, for, for a period of time now. As you look at what we need as a country, I think we need roughly, call it, a million five in housing starts a year just to take care of things like disaster recovery, second homes, immigration, new family formation. And we've been under that number for quite some time. So we need to get back to that place. Additionally, as you talk about rate being impactful on new construction, two thirds of our residential business is in the remodel side. And we need to see some existing home turnover because you're right, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of existing home turnover as people are sitting in uh, some lower mortgage rates and are looking to have that uh, mortgage rate come down before they start that uh, sale process. And for the remodel side of our world, that means remodeling before you put your home on the market and then making it your own once that home is sold. Mm. And so we think we're still a bit of time out as that plays through. But the good news over the medium term is we've got to get back after building, uh, some would say, three to four million homes shy of what we need in this country. And so we've got to get back to building new homes in order to start to mitigate some of that price impact and make housing more affordable as we go through. So 50 basis points, good start. We still mm -hmm. need to see that play through as we go through and into the next calendar year. And Kevin, we don't have much time left with you at all, but uh, we're 26 days away from the presidential election. Looking through your notes, I know that the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act were pretty significant for Ferguson. And as we look to a possible change in administration, well, either way, we're going to get someone new in the Oval Office. How are you planning around that, a potential change there, potentially in party? As you would imagine, we plan for both outcomes or any outcome that's that's coming down the pike. And I won't necessarily speak to the election and, and how that's going to play out and, and what that means for Ferguson. But if we look at both the res and non-res sector, there are good tailwinds that will develop. As we discussed, 
We're underbuilt from a housing perspective. We need to build more houses in this country. And on the non-res side of the world, yes, there were those tailwinds like the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, and so forth. But when you look at what's happening with AI, what's happening with data center construction, for example, that's going to be a tailwind. That's a positive for the American economy. That's a real positive for us. Water-cooled data centers are enormously product intensive for a company like ours with steel pipe, fire suppression, industrial pipe valve and fitting. Mm. Those tailwinds will continue. All right. Hey, Kevin, great talking. Thanks so much for joining us. Kevin Murphy there of Ferguson. I want to get a quick check on the markets right now. For that, we go to Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abby? Well, Matt, today we don't have the stocks doing all that much, just very small moves to the upside and the downside. But over the last five days, you can see there's a fair amount of volatility here for the S&P 500, up nearly 1% over that time period. Beneath the hood today, though, lots of big moves, starting off with the shares of Astera Labs, the semiconductor chip company, related chip company. Well, they have released a new uh, switch that is related to AI. You can see the stock very responding really well. Norwegian Cruise higher as City has upgraded to a buy. Boeing, though, down 2.7 percent. Labor union talks broke down. That strike continues. And then Alphabet, of course, there's the big story around the possibility of the U.S. seeking to break up this company. Now, when we put it all together with volatility that we were showing and here for these individual stocks, we have something interesting going on, which is the VIX spot VIX is higher than the VIX curve. That is, means it's in backwardation. Relative to October, it's just very very slight, but both of those um, areas above 20, and then we have November and uh, early January between 19 and 20. But again, that's a little bit backward, Katie, because of course the future should be more uncertain. But I would say with the tensions in the Middle East and the election and everything else going on, well, investors are a little bit on edge. All right, Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. This is Bloomberg. And it's time now for our daily Wall Street Week conversation. And governments theoretically are supposed to work for the people. But what happens when large portions of people feel left behind? David Weston speaks with former House Speaker Eric Cantor about the effects of populism, both good and bad. And so where, where I think we are in, in the country is um, there, there's a real desire for some answers on the part of a lot of people that, that have missed out on this hope and, and prosperity and opportunity. And I know when I was... Um, um, in, in office uh, that the populism of the day was the so-called Tea Party. Uh, and this was, um, I, I think, the initial surge in what we now have on my side um, of the MAGA movement. And these were people who really had otherwise not really been involved in the political process, had come into it largely due to social media and the ability to gather together much more quickly and to identify each other's, you know, commonality. And uh, back then, the Tea Party, if you remember, it was taxed enough already. Um, we discerned that maybe that was due to the overarching reach of government and that government had gotten too big and we were spending too much money in Washington. Uh, and so our prescription to respond to that was to try and really stick to a, a course of fiscal discipline, try and return the fiscal imbalances back to some prudence in Washington. I think what I have seen since um, being off Capitol Hill is that notion that somehow there was a philosophical underpinning to the rise in populism really wasn't necessarily what was going on. It was just some real anger. Uh, and so I think the populism has deepened on both sides. Uh, and um, again, it is, uh, I think, a, a, a portion of the electorate that's looking for an answer and then politicians and those running for office that have found it's an easy way to respond to this anger and to provide a short-term uh, fix, if you will, uh, to a bunch of really angry people. And unfortunately, I think that longer term, some of the policies that result from um, reaching out to people who are angry aren't necessarily what I think the country would need. Let's talk about some of those policies. Uh, I, I associate particularly tariffs, America first, immigration restriction with uh, economic populism. And as you suggest, that's not unique to the Republicans at this point. 
Right, no, absolutely not. And there's another example of an economic policy that is very populist and very popular, and that's the no tax on tips. You know, the minute that Donald Trump came out with that, Kamala Harris was a Me Too right afterwards, because of course, that is a direct sort of response to a population, especially in the swing state of Nevada, um, which uh, many, many people rely on tips. And so, of course, that's going to put more money back into their pockets. And that's to me, as a fiscal conservative, a good thing. Let people keep more of their money. But the real issue there is what makes someone who gets a, a big proportion of their income in tips any different from a wage earner who may have and make the same amount of money at the same level of income? Why is it that that form of income is any more favored than just a wage earner? And I think that if we're going to think about policy, and economic policy, tax policy, what we ought to be doing is trying to provide incentives for investment, uh, for growth, for capital expense, because that's the way we can create jobs and have more of them and have more prosperity go to more people. And that was former House Speaker Eric Cantor speaking to David Weston. You can catch Wall Street Week every Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. This is Bloomberg. We are 26 days until the election and a political battle is brewing over Hurricane Milton. The storm is heading towards Florida and is expected to make landfall overnight. Kaylee Lines, co-anchor of Balance of Power, joins us now from Washington. We've seen this building up through Helene, uh, Kaylee. You know, President Trump at first criticizing Kamala Harris for not going um, to North Carolina, criticizing Biden um, as well. Now. The president is overseeing, I guess, uh, preparations for Milton. Where do we stand? Well, the president is overseeing that along with FEMA, Matt, and the president has been in touch with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Their relationship seems to be working just fine here, but we are seeing politics bleed in from the presidential candidates into how this uh, storm response is going. As Ron DeSantis is not speaking with Vice President Kamala Harris, despite her attempt to call him, that's being cast as political, that the vice president doesn't necessarily have a role in storm response historically. And you also have Donald Trump on the other side, propagating misinformation and disinformation about the hurricane response, including what people can expect of FEMA suggestions that FEMA money was uh, just essentially stolen, uh, stolen and is now missing, was sent uh, to care for migrants. None of those things are, are true. And so the disinformation, misinformation campaign is something else we're paying attention to, so much so that a Republican congressman from North Carolina, Chuck Edwards, had to put out a statement yesterday debunking some of the rumors that are out there. The first item in it is Hurricane Helene was not geoengineered by the government. Sub bullet, nobody can control the weather because that is actually something that has been suggested as we've tracked these storms over the last few weeks. No, you're completely right. I've seen it all over social media, which is pretty wild and uh, wild to the point that now we've had to get an official statement there. So obviously the hurricane response has become a big political issue. I do want to talk about, of course, in the home stretch to the election, we've got some news in the last hour or so that President, former President Donald Trump plans to hold a rally in New York City's Madison Square Garden. You think about the security and logistical details of this, probably protesters coming to New York City as well. Sounds like a bit of a headache, Kaylee. Absolutely going to be a security headache, especially when you're considering the elevated security that now goes wherever Donald Trump goes because of the two attempts on his life, not to mention the logistical nightmare of it being in uh, Manhattan. Obviously, the city is somewhat used to this, having uh, Trump appearing at Trump Tower or when he was in court uh, in New York earlier this year. There's always security headaches that come with appearances for him. But a rally of this scale certainly would be uh, a whole different ball game. That said, New York, of course, a state where Donald Trump has continually tried to um, make it turn more for him than it has been historically. And we have to consider the important congressional races in New York. New York is a state that ultimately could decide the majority in Congress is there are a number of Republicans who are in districts that Biden won in 2020 who were trying to hold on to their seats. A lot of the flipping of the House uh, game is going to be centered in New York, which, even though it's not a swing state, does put it more at the center of the political universe.
Yeah, at least New York City uh, seems reluctant to embrace Donald Trump. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines in Washington, thank you so much. And for more news and analysis on the election, you can type ELEC Go on your terminal, Matt. I know that's one of your favorite functions among many when it comes to just the election. Yeah, I like the uh, worksheet library. Yeah. Um, so WSL space election or WSL space elect map um, has been really interesting lately as we've seen some flips uh, there. We'll keep you uh, posted. Quick check on the markets Quick as check. we go to break. Yeah, we have some green on the screen, of course. A uh, lot of uh, time before 4 p.m. and we know this has been a volatile market, so we'll see if that holds. But coming up tomorrow on Open Interest, we'll be talking to the CEO of KBW. This is Bloomberg.